in some ways, we had the most detailed product roadmap we've ever had at Runway when we were uh, 10 people and had a very five-year vision of how like we would build kind of a, a future futuristic video editing product. And it turned out that we learned so much during the first quarter that that vision no longer made sense. Uh, so actually a lot of uh, like our product development processes shifted towards making less assumptions, having very ambitious goals, but actually really leaving the space for learning while developing the thing and really being open to surprise, being open to, you know, maybe in the middle of building this product or this research project, a paper comes out that makes it uh, like that makes the project already outdated. Culturally, we've learned to like embrace change and like be excited by change. Otherwise, people really get too committed on like an idea that might not be the direction where uh, where things are going. Welcome to In Depth, a show that surfaces tactical advice founders and startup leaders need to grow their teams, companies, and themselves. I'm Brett Burson, a partner at First Round, and we're a venture capital firm that helps startups like Notion, Roblox, Uber, and Square tackle company building firsts. On the in-depth podcast, we share weekly conversations with startup leaders that skip the talking points and go deeper into not just what to do, but how to do it. Learn more and subscribe today at firstround.com. Hi, everyone, and welcome to In-Depth. I'm Todd Jackson, and I'm a partner at First Round. I'm back guest hosting the latest episode in our series that explores founders' different paths to product market fit. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Anastasis Germanidis, co-founder and CTO of Runway. Runway is an applied AI research company that can generate fully produced videos with just a few simple words. It does this through its suite of magic AI and ML tools that generate storytelling content, mainly videos, using text, images, or video clips. Imagine filming a short scene of a simple set made of cardboard with your phone in your living room. Runway can transform that footage into custom animated clips with only a prompt. It's no surprise that it's already a favorite among video editors, art directors, and amateur film buffs alike. Some big name customers include brand designers at New Balance, Alicia Keys' music producer, and video editors at The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. The company is fresh off a $141 million Series C funding round, and counts Google, NVIDIA, and Salesforce as a few of its investors. In our conversation today, we get into the weeds of what it's like to build products in the rapidly evolving field of AI right now. We start by chatting about Runway's origin story and how the co-founders' roots in the creative industry helped them get to their first 100 customers faster. We then spend the bulk of the episode talking about Runway's unique approach to designing its product development org. As a company that spends more time and resources on research than the average tech startup, Anastasis shares some critical insights he learned building different internal processes that helped enable his team to build products at scale. This episode is a great listen for founders or operators who are curious about what to expect when building an AI company, or for anyone who wants an inside look at how cutting edge technology is being used to help transform the creative industry. And now, on to my conversation with Anastasis. Anastasis, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Zone. Glad to be here. Runway has some really impressive customers in TV and film and video editing. And I know that you and your co-founders all have a shared background in film. So can you share a little bit about what you were doing before you started Runway and kind of how you all met? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say something we, we like to say at Runway is uh, Runway was started by three failed film, filmmakers. Uh, so we all had were involved in film on one way or another, but uh, were uh, kind of having hybrid careers, different for each of the co-founders. My personal story is I was um, primarily an engineer, uh, but also an artist. And kind of what I was balancing both kind of working at startups, doing kind of backend engineering, distributed systems engineer, and then ML engineering. And then at the same time, I was kind of developing my own kind of uh, artwork. The artwork was based on kind of interactive uh, art. So technology was involved in the process as well. Uh, but the two worlds were pretty separate. So three co-founders we met in uh, art school, uh, which is not the place where usually AI companies start from. Uh, so we met at the program at NYU uh, that was kind of focused on the intersection of art and technology. Uh, and we started making small projects together, uh, primarily exploring ways in which uh, machine learning could be applied for creative use cases. At that point, um, 
deep learning was still much more kind of nascent. There was just starting to be uh, interesting applications, primarily like convolution neural networks for uh, art and creativity. And so we just started building small tools and just giving them to artists, designers, filmmakers, seeing what they did with that. With that. Did all three of you have uh, both kind of machine learning backgrounds and, and were writing code and kind of artistic and creative backgrounds? So uh, my co-founders, uh, Chris and Alejandro, uh, Chris uh, had a, a mix of um, artistic business and kind of innovation background. And Alejandro had a primarily design background. So they came to this, this program was called, uh, like one way to phrase this program is where artists go to become engineers and engineers go to become artists. And that was more from the engineering um, side. And then Chris and Alejandro were more from the art side and kind of moving into technology. So that's kind of where we intersected and kind of started working together. Very cool. Okay, so what were some of the early projects that you all worked on together? I remember one uh, very well. Uh, so... Just to give some context, um, around like 2016, 2017, there were some early uh, generative models that were coming out on the image domain. Uh, and one of them was uh, had been released, an open source model by NVIDIA. And basically, it's a generative model that was trained on uh, uh, actually driving footage. So it was primarily a self-driving car data set. Uh, and the main idea was, was you could take a very high level map of a scene and then generate kind of almost like a street view uh, um, kind of scene that's based on the map that you provided. Uh, so we decided to take this like rather like dry and utilitarian uh, use case into a more creative uh, direction. So we we built this very simple drawing tool that basically let you create your own street view uh, of sorts. And we immediately people started making all kinds of like weird things with it, like like they would uh, build like giant pedestrians and like tiny cars or like a a, a scene that was like raining from street sign. So it was kind of an initial um, evidence that you could take um, like a lot of those models and research have been developed for more utilitarian, uh, let's say, purposes and not necessarily creative use cases. But you could, if you view it from the right lens and you apply more like uh, artistic or creative tools thinking around those models, you can build really compelling visual results for them. And if you get into the right uh, folks that have kind of this uh, artistic motivation and creative background. Uh, and so... Kind of high level that approach is what we took later on with kind of building runway. Was the goal to make art or was it to make technology or sort of how did those projects that you were doing, what was the thing driving you to do them? The main goal was to explore the potential of this technology uh, in an open-ended fashion. Uh, we were still at school at the time and the kind of purpose of our projects was to just like, this is a new medium. Let's explore like what's what makes sense in terms of new interfaces, in terms of tools around this technology. There was no, because it was so early for those models to be used in that context, there were no principles of like, how do you build products around it or tools around it? And so a lot of the initial goal was more exploration. And then something we're seeing was like, once artists understood how to use those tools, they would make amazing things with those tools, but it was the barrier to entry was really high. So just providing that like translation layer between between this technology and AI models and the more vocabulary of creative tools and design tools that artists were more familiar with had a lot of potential for us because it kind of unlocked this like potential energy of like creativity. Okay. And then what was the moment that you said, hey, you know, one of these projects, we want to turn this into a product. We want to we want to turn this into the thing that would become runway. Like when did that happen? So we uh, we were pretty convinced towards the end of the program that we wanted to spend kind of like after the program, we want to uh, be involved uh, in building tools in this kind of intersection of ML and creativity. Um, but we didn't quite know the shape of that. What we had initially in mind was um, we we're going to start this uh, creative studio where we'd work with different clients and build like and help them incorporate machine learning into their art projects or uh, museum projects, for example, or like film projects. And that would be more of a kind of consultancy. But uh, it turned out that uh, Runway, which was originally um, Chris, my co-founder's thesis project, it turned out that that, that had uh, gotten some initial interest and traction. Uh, and so we just decided to uh, focus on that instead of our plans to build this uh, creative studio. So what did that project look like at the very beginning? Yeah, so the first version of Runway was um, a simple... I would say a wrapper around uh, Docker. So Docker is this containerization technology. And one of the biggest problems when using those models early on was 
like right now, the frameworks that people use around machine learning have become pretty much uh, centralized, a lot more around PyTorch and um, a few specific choices. But at that point, it was much more fragmented. So figuring out how to actually run those models was a really uh, time-consuming process. So the first version of Runway was uh, essentially uh, a model hub that allowed you to run a variety of machine learning models uh, via Docker and allowed you to use them very intuitively. So you could run a post estimation model and then use kind of um, build a project around gestural interactions by just taking the post data. And then, for example, you could kind of build a way to control virtual objects via pose. So it was a very easy way to use those models in a variety of creative projects uh, via a kind of interface that was kind of simplified and did not include a lot of the kind of technical um, details of those models. I mean, is that kind of similar to some of the model hubs that have gotten popular in the last couple of years? Yeah, it's uh, in some ways, uh, it was an idea uh, early for its time, like that uh, I think hugging face spaces or replicate and maybe a more modern version of that same idea around Model Hub. Um, but for us from the beginning, even though we were taking this Model Hub approach, it was very, very specifically targeting creative use cases and a creative kind of creative domain and like visual applications rather than broadly uh, all kinds of uh, models like classification models or regression models and so forth. So for us, it was still a model hub, but like very specific to like creative use case and creative tools. And so that, how did that idea, that original idea kind of morph into, into what Runway is now? Uh, through a lot of uh, iteration and learning. Um, so the, I can walk you through kind of the, uh, some of the steps that we took along the way. So we released the first version of Runway in uh, January of uh, 2019. And that was uh, kind of a, a model hub around open source models for a variety of primarily visual tasks. So things like stylization or pose estimation or segmentation, and people could use them in all kinds of interesting ways. Uh, what we like realized very early on was that like people could experiment and prototype really interesting things with that. But the moment they really wanted to put this into production or build like real projects with it, there was still that like gap between what open source models could do and like the specific getting the performance that they needed for their own uh, project. And that might have been just because the model was, uh, they might have a specific kind of style illustration that was not what the model was good at generating and so forth. Uh, so one of the kind of the biggest initial milestone was just providing the way for people to build and train their own generative models. So essentially they could upload an image data set that, that could be anything from you know, they're, if it's a visual artist, they're on illustrations, uh, filmmakers would kind of um, train a model based on the storyboards or architects would train a model based on like architectural designs. And then they would generate uh, images that were similar to the data sets that they, uh, they've trained with. And that was the first, um, the first insight there was just the ability to customize and build your own models was really, uh, really compelling for people. And that was the first like inflection point where we saw like uh, a much uh, greater adoption of the of the of the tool, and that was very novel at the time. I'm guessing there was nothing else like that out there. Yeah, there was no uh, generative AI was not a, a term that was uh, commonly used, uh, and also when talking to uh, investors and a lot of people in kind of the tech world, it was a bit of a strange concept, and kind of to some degree it was justified because the results of those models were not quite the fidelity of the results and the quality is not quite what it is today. But even earlier on, it was clear there was something really, really compelling about being able to kind of generate, generate kind of visual content using those models. Cool. Okay. And so when did you decide to make this into a company? So that was uh, a few months after uh, we graduated from grad school. So it was clear to us this was what we wanted to do. First of all, we really enjoyed working with each other. We knew we had, there was a sense that just because we collaborate so well, we're going to figure it out. And like, we're going to like, there are going to be a lot of iteration and learning and like things might change a lot, but we wanted to kind of work and collaborate together on this field of like creativity and ML. Uh, and so that's, that was kind of the main motivation of, of building this company. And also just the belief that, um, given the rate of progress in this field, it was clear that those methods like generative models and, uh, AI techniques would really be adopted at kind of a mass scale within the industry. Timing those things is always difficult, but we knew that there would be a point where that would happen. Uh, so we uh, incorporated in uh, late uh, 2018, and then we launched the first version in uh, like January of 2019. 
And initially, did you have a sense of like, hey, we are building this for video editors or photographers or like a certain segment of the market? Or were you just kind of generally interested in what AI could do for creative tools? The way we approached uh, kind of this product development process was like, how do we learn as much as possible in the short period of time? And so the early version of Run was fairly broad and included, like you could use it for a variety of different like creative workflows and it wasn't specifically limited to video or filmmaking. And and that was something that kind of emerged in terms of like how we saw people were using the platform was that um, even, even when working with image specific models, they ended up just processing uh, every frame of it for, towards like building a final video. Uh, so they were kind of repurposing some of the models that were not quite meant to be used on the kind of video context uh, for uh, as part of like a video creation or kind of filmmaking uh, workflow. So basically you're saying that like people were using the early version runway to edit like frame by frame because they, what they actually wanted to do was, was create a video or edit a video, even though the tool itself like was sort of frame by frame at that point. Exactly. Yeah. And initially it wasn't really working that well for frame by frame, but just we saw people repeatedly doing that. So we like kind of realized there might be something there and we should kind of, rather than thinking those kind of generic tools that can work with any model, let's build more video specific uh, tools. Uh, and that, so that's what kind of was the next, next iteration of Runway. Okay. So the, the version in 20, the version 2019 launched and it was fairly generic in terms of the use cases that supported. And then what, when did the sort of focus more on video start to happen? Uh, Mid 2020, we, we did release some small, some model updates and some kind of minor uh, um, features around video, but really the, the big shift towards video tools um, happened with uh, when we released a tool that was called green screen and green screen is um, what's called in a video editing a rotoscoping tool. And rotoscoping is the process of um, segmenting out a subject in a video. So removing the background from a subject or just, or, or kind of vice versa. Uh, and that's a very common thing that kind of video editors and VFX artists do. Uh, it's one of the most time consuming and least uh, pleasant uh, aspects of video editing because you, you basically, with traditional video editing tools, you basically go frame by frame and you're annotating the subject and you have to kind of correct mistakes of the model. And like, it's a very, very time consuming process, but it's a necessary process because if you want to make any effects that are specific, that are only applied to one area of the video, that's kind of the first step towards all those different uh, visual effects. And so it's a very common thing that's done in pretty much every VFX production. So uh, as part of building green screen, another realization was we needed to really start doing this research and model development in-house, and we couldn't necessarily rely on existing models that were out there or small kind of minor fine tunings of existing models. And so that was another aspect too, that was kind of a big change for Runways kind of uh, transforming into uh, a more research focused company. But essentially green screen, when we released green screen, we saw a really big uh, shift in like how the product was used, where before it was primarily used as a prototyping tool. It was used a lot by universities as a way to teach what's possible with machine learning. It was used by um, um, innovation groups and like uh, R&D uh, groups to experiment with machine learning. And with green screen, it was the first time that it was really used for production. And it was used by something that was like really critical to people's workflows. And it was used by, by folks that were not like intentionally wanting to use AI. Uh, it was not like, I want to find what's the best tool to utilize AI techniques. It was more, I just want to find the best tool for the job. And so that was, that was a shift that we saw that translated into a big growth in terms of the user base and revenue but really make us understand like the difference of, of what it takes to build tools that actually can be used in production versus tools that essentially are, are only being used in, uh, for prototyping. So you were already getting some attention and usage prior to green screen, it sounds like. And it was in kind of more academic use cases, but it, you were, it was already kind of popular, right? And then green screen made it very popular. Is that kind of how you think about it? We had gotten a lot of adoption in universities. I think that was kind of the number uh, one driver of growth. Essentially, um, Runway was already kind of in the first year being used in many, many different art schools. Like some of the top arts, arts schools in the world were using Runway as part of the, the class that was introducing art students into new technologies and AI and so forth. And so that was kind of an initial use case that we found where it was really with the first version of Runway, it's just very easy to like try out like 30 different models, understand like 
kind of the scope and like a space of possibilities. And then also train your own model on like specific, um, like students would basically train their own models to, to build projects around. Um, so some really compelling use cases there. And it actually turned out that that version of Runway, in, in some ways ahead of its time in terms of like generative models becoming a very core piece of the product itself today. I mean, that makes sense to me that the early versions were sort of adopted by students, um, you know, who are interested in kind of the AI side of it themselves and wanted to kind of tinker with it and see what it could do. And then green screen all of a sudden came along and it was useful for professionals like it, and who didn't care whether, you know, about the AI behind it necessarily, but it, it did the job for them. How did, how did that affect you guys as a company? Did it, did it encourage you to start building for kind of the professional market? The learning there was that um, those techniques could really have a huge uh, amount of value for professionals today. And so the next step was releasing more tools that um, kind of combine um, kind of video editing uh, tooling and functionality together with the kind of magic of uh, AI and the kind of uh, AI assisted workflows. Um, so the next uh, tool that we released was called InPainting and it allowed you to remove uh, diff objects from a video or remove small mistakes from a video. Like, um, and that was also a very tedious part of, uh, of a v VFX workflow. Um, so we started trying to solve like those specific, really tedious aspects of uh, video editing and VFX. Uh, and at the same time, it started sort of trying to build a more kind of fully featured creative toolkit that didn't necessarily, not every functionality needed to be powered by ML. Um, the AI functionality was the thing that drove a lot of folks into the product because it allowed them to do things a lot faster. But then once they uh, were uh, users of Runway, then they could uh, perform a lot of the other aspects of uh, editing. We had a, a product, a video editing product with a timeline and a, a effect stack and like things that you'd expect from a nonlinear video editor. So the ML tools were the thing that brought people to the platform, but then they stayed because they could do a lot of the other kind of aspects of video editing inside Runway. Okay. And how big was the company at this point when you started to add all these other features on top of green screen? We were between uh, like 10 and 20 people at that point. Uh, so still fairly small. Uh, we, we generally, for the kind of life cycle of the company, try to remain uh, lean and like grow very intentionally. Uh, and so at every stage of the company, we're probably smaller than we, sh we should be, according to kind of benchmarks of the industry, but that's kind of been an intentional choice on our end. And so when you were leaning into these video editing and VFX cases, use cases, were you getting a lot of feedback from customers and talking to folks in the industry, or were you sort of just following your own gut? Like the three of you all had experience um, in filmmaking. So where, like, you know, how, how customer driven was it versus how much, how intuition driven was it by you guys? This has been a really, um, recurring question in how we build product and our thinking around that has changed quite a bit. When we were building the video editing tools and those uh, earlier ML products, we really believed in starting from the customer problem and the user problem and then solving backwards and using, incorporating the, the technology where it was needed, uh, which sounds like the, uh, the, a good practice in general. It's something that uh, all companies should do. But the thing that was that we realized uh, later on was because those um, uh, AI models and like AI research was advancing so quickly, it was hard for people to necessarily know all the ways in this in which those could be transformed into products and have a lot of value. Uh, and so initially, our thinking was really like the traditional kind of product development and like inputs to the product development process of being right, like sitting with customers, doing a lot of user interviews which we still do, uh, there's still a very critical part of the process of developing products. But um, what we realized as we kept building those products was starting from like research that just uh, like became possible and identifying some, kind of having uh, some hypothesis of the ways in which it could really, we could build like really strong and valuable tools around was a, a development process that actually uh, ended up working better for us in many ways. Interesting. Okay. And so how do you think about that today? So today we have this, I would say there, there is the kind of long-term view and like the North Star uh, that we're working towards that informs our uh, kind of research roadmap. And then there is the day-to-day -day or week-by-week -week updates that we make the product. And the the week-by-week -week kind of more incremental updates are really informed by what we hear from users. Like, thankfully, we have a very uh, vocal, engaged user base. So we know pretty much at any given point, these are the top five things 
that people uh, want to see improved. And so one example is releasing the ability. So we're currently working on Gen 2, a text to video model, and we releasing the ability to control the camera movement inside a video was the top feature request for ever since we released it. So those things come from uh, customers and our users. But then there is kind of the long-term roadmap uh, that informs the kind of larger investments we make in research that might take uh, half a year of just pure R&D work that doesn't see, uh, that doesn't end up in the product. And those are things like we want to eventually uh, make it possible to generate using generative models to build an entire like feature length film. And we want to solve all the, all the problems along the way to get there. And that's not something that could be tackled necessarily in a very incremental way. You can definitely have milestones in that research, but you need to make the investment and go through this process of trial and error on the research side to be able to make progress towards it versus always kind of uh, getting reality checks of whether this, uh, the approach you're taking is working and like having to deploy everything in the, in the piece to monitor the product. So these are the kind of the two different contradictory in some ways, but we try to figure out how to balance those two viewpoints. So you mentioned, Anastasis, that you have a very vocal community. What, how did that start to take shape? Like in 2020, 2021, who are, who are the, the users and the customers who are really kind of excited about the product and helping you push the product forward? What kind of, what kind of people were these? When we first started out, um, we, uh, we essentially started from the art community and the art technology community. In certain ways, it was an advantage because that was uh, a community that really there were not dedicated AI tools for it. A lot of the AI tools were kind of built for, uh, from ML engineers for ML engineers. Uh, and so from the very beginning, we had a very active kind of small at the time community of artists and technologies. Some of them uh, kind of had the, uh, went to the same grad school as us, some of them in similar kind of programs as us. But the whole community of creative technologies is quite small and like everybody kind of knows each other. And that has been really, uh, it was really nice because as we were kind of releasing each new feature, like we basically were getting real time feedback, even early on when the user base was small, uh, not a lot of people care about what we're doing, but the people inside this small community really saw Runway as kind of the only, the only tool that was kind of addressing the kind of the needs that they had. Is that still kind of your main vocal user base? The user base has uh, expanded uh, quite uh, quite dramatically in the past in the past few years. Many of the kind of Fortune 100 companies using Runway. We have individual creators to you know, small teams of creators to large companies, media companies, ad agencies. But th- there's also this emerging movement of uh, AI filmmakers and AI content creators that uh, has allowed us to kind of co-create the models and the product with them. Essentially, uh, so when we first released. Um, Gen 2, our text to video model, we first rolled out uh, access to a very small uh, group of uh, 100 or so creators on Discord. And, and these creators kind of were very familiar with how all the uh, usual limitations of those models and are very exploratory and know how to see the kind of identify all the ways in which they could be used. Uh, and so that constant feedback and the collaboration and communication uh, with this community has been really critical for us to fine tune those models to understand what are the ways in which we should, um, as we build the products and the tools around those models, like w- how do we highlight the strengths and kind of guide people towards good results? And that early feedback is really critical for that because it's such an early space and um, it's a, almost kind of a new medium that's emerging around AI video and AI, AI film. Uh, we really try to not just grow the product, not just grow the models, but really grow the community and showcase to the kind of outer world what's kind of possible uh, with those models. So we've organized um, uh, an AI film festival uh, early this year, which kind of showcasing creators and like uh, artists using AI to make short films. We're doing that again next year. We just had last weekend, actually, a 48 hour film festival where thousands of uh, of folks uh, uh, were had to create a film using Runway within 48 hours. And we saw kind of a lot of amazing things coming out of that. Um, so I'm curious, you've mentioned the rollout of Gen 2 a couple times. Like when you rolled out Gen 1, I'm curious, what are the initial things that you saw people do with it that really got you excited? And then same question for Gen 2, because I assume that Gen 2, you know, is a lot more advanced. And I'm curious what those first 100 users were doing kind of when Gen 1 came around and then when Gen 2 came around. So we released Gen 1 in January of this year. And Gen 1, for, for context, is a video-to-video model. 
So you uh, have an initial video that maybe you shot from a camera and you can transform it into another video based on the text prompt. Uh, so you can, uh, for example, uh, shoot a video and then describe a different style for the video, uh, like a claymation style, uh, and then uh, generate a video that's transformed, uh, that maintains the structure of the input video, uh, but uh, adopts the style or the content that's described by the prompt. And what was interesting when rolling that out was like there were a lot of ways of using the model and uh, uh, that we hadn't anticipated. Um, uh, for example, we saw a lot of uh, folks that were making, basically uh, being able to uh, create really complex scenes and, uh, and settings using like very simple materials like cardboard. So they would make a city out of cardboard in their living room, and then they would kind of um, shoot it with their camera and that would become a castle or like a, a spaceship. And it would be really compelling how you could essentially create those uh, really uh, big productions uh, from just your living room with just your phone camera. Uh, so we saw a lot of use cases around that that were uh, really compelling. People were creating some amazing results with very simple materials or even with just 3D, like untextured 3D models. Uh, so uh, Gen 1 became this kind of model that would be able to take some... Uh, a mesh of a, let's say building and then be able to transform it into a uh, kind of a full kind of photorealistic rendition of that building. So what Gen 1 allowed is this level of kind of control and flexibility, but combined with kind of the creativity of the model itself. Uh, Gen 2 is a slightly different model. It's a text to video model. You're no longer providing an input video, but rather you're just providing a text description of a scene and get the final result. And the advantage of that is you don't even need to kind of have a driving video that you're transforming to another video. And immediately when we released Gen 2, there was kind of this really wide spectrum of use cases that we hadn't quite anticipated. A lot of them, uh, like we saw a large number of people making short films with uh, Gen 2, making uh, uh, commercials for products that don't exist, making a lot of really a wide variety of, of animated styles and kind of primarily more narrative content versus uh, with Gen 1, we were seeing really compelling, let's say, few second shots. But with Gen 2, we started seeing this kind of more larger narratives emerging because you no longer, you could just describe each individual scene and you didn't need to find a physical world analog for each of the components of it. Right now, we're seeing people combine Gen 1 and Gen 2 in interesting ways. So they can use Gen 2 for a lot of the footage in the final output uh, where you don't need that very precise control. But then when you have a, let's say a character speaking or, or uh, emoting in certain ways uh, where you need that, that fidelity and like the level of expressiveness, you can use Gen 1 for just those pieces. Uh, so I think both models currently have their place in the workflow and we're seeing a lot of interesting ways in which they're used in conjunction. I think it's interesting you said when you rolled out Gen 2 this year, you started with just 100 users and it was 100 users uh, that you talked to on Discord. How do you how do you choose who's in that set of 100 users? Are, is it a, a variety of different kinds of creators or is there a specific type that you look that you focus on? In the beginning primarily uh, it was our users of runway that we already knew from using earlier iterations of the product and we were already kind of seeing kind of some amazing things that they've done. Some of the artists were had submitted and shown films at the film festival. So a lot of that initial group it was people that we had already seen their work, that were already ma making compelling, interesting things with AI. And kind of we grew from there. And there's a lot of amazing creators that emerged when the kind of the community expanded and just started doing their AI work with Gen 2 was kind of the first model that they really started making uh, uh, projects with. Uh, but that initial group was people that kind of we had seen using kind of runway extensively before or making really interesting work with AI with previous models, like with image models or uh, other uh, other tools in the past. Okay, and then how do you decide when it's ready to go beyond 100 people? Is it a quality thing? Is it a user feedback thing? Is it a um, performance and latency and cost thing? How do you think about that? Uh, it's a mix of uh, all of those things, uh, primarily quality. Uh, even at the early days of, of Discord, we had uh, a mechanism by which you could provide uh, feedback of whether a result was uh, satisfactory or not. And we kind of relentlessly tracked 
the measure of like how what percentage of videos where people were finding to be satisfactory or like kind of met uh, the expectations or were aligned with like the description they provided. Uh, and so that became kind of the the me- the quantitative measure that we track to see is this ready for a, a wider rollout. Uh, of course, there would need to be product work and kind of UI work to make sure that we can build the right front end around those models and going beyond kind of the Discord limitations. Uh, and there was also, as we were rolling out the model and we started from 100, but then we went to 1,000 to 10,000 before we rolled out the web and mobile version of, of Gen2, uh, we also had a much better sense of like for capacity planning to understand in terms of infrastructure, if we're ready uh, to deploy this to kind of everyone who uses Runway. So a lot of those considerations. Then the other part was also the safety considerations of making sure we can uh, have the right uh, measures in place in terms of content moderation uh, to make sure that like once we roll it out to a much larger set of users, that it wouldn't be used in kind of uh, malicious ways. What? How do you guys think about uh, safety and content moderation? What is? What's your approach? Yeah, so everything that you generate within Runway goes through content moderation uh, models, both text moderation and visual moderation. Like it's almost like it's a multi-model uh, problem where uh, we essentially, the way we operate on the kind of our uh, alignment and safety team is just thinking ahead of like assuming that, you know, the technology will get more and more photorealistic uh, and just thinking of where with this, these models being six months and then kind of starting and lay, laying out the, the, the groundwork uh, for that. Like we started building those kind of content moderation uh, methods earlier in the year, even with Gen 1, it's kind of, it's difficult to really uh, use it in malicious ways. It's a fairly limited model, but even then we, we wanted to roll out those, those uh, models and methods in order to make sure that as the models improved, that we would, wouldn't need to kind of uh, do a, a lot of catch up in terms of the content moderation and we would be kind of well prepared for that. Okay. I want to switch gears a little bit, Anastasis. One of the things that I've heard you talk about that I think is really interesting is that Runway is different than kind of a normal tech company in terms of like a normal tech company is mostly focused on product development. Whereas at Runway, I think you have product development and, and, a, and a very large research component to what you do. And so I'm curious, how did you think about kind of organizing both the research side of things and the product development side of things early on? And then how has that kind of changed over the years? There have been a lot of learnings in how we combine research and more uh, traditional product development and runway. The biggest early learning for that was initially we had kind of similar schedules in how we're thinking about developing new research and developing new product. Uh, and so we expected results, like compelling results from a research project in the span of a few weeks. And if those results weren't there, then we kind of move to the next project. Uh, and we found that that was a very, very difficult um, timeline to follow to actually execute more kind of ambitious projects on the research side. What was an example of that? One concrete example was when we first released Green Screen, it was merely a, a segmentation model. So that essentially means it, it tells you for every pixel of a frame uh, what's in the foreground and what's in the background. Uh, and there is no space for in between. Uh, but in practice, you have uh, uh, you really want to solve this problem with a matting method, which is uh, like, for example, if you take hair, there might be kind of uh, intermediate, tra- like semi-transparent objects uh, in the frame. Uh, and we initially wanted to solve this problem uh, and just update our segmentation model to be matting problem because that produced better results when you kind of uh, segmented out the subject and blend it with another background. And we initially tried to tackle this project in this kind of one week uh timelines of just let's try out this idea if it doesn't work then we move to the next idea and just we kept hitting a wall where we actually were not getting the improvements that we wanted or we were solving the problem but like in a very limited way Uh, and we never ended up when we kind of had this updated version of the model it was barely better than the previous version and it was really there was no justification for actually rolling it out so we just made the intentional choice of let's completely separate the roadmap of the research project of improving the matting and then the regular product development process. And there were a lot of improvements we could make to the product itself that didn't depend on a better model, just a lot of workflow improvements or making sure that the user will annotate frames properly and guiding the user along the way. And so we, uh, instead of having product wait for a specific research update, we let the research run for, of course, there's always a time boxing. You don't want it to run for years, but we basically give more breathing room for the research project. 
And when the, the research project is ready, then we bring the rest of product and engineering and design to incorporate that update into the product. And we found that to kind of minimize the dependencies between the two. So for a project like that, a research project like Matting, you must have known that it was a tractable, solvable problem on, on some time horizon, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have invested in it. Like, How, how do you decide whether, okay, this is going to take a long time, but we're, we want to invest in it from a research perspective because we think it's going to be really important. Like, how, how, does it, how do you decide whether an idea qualifies or not for that? Yeah, uh, I, I wish I could say it's a fully like 100% calculated decision of like, you never have enough data to have like absolute confidence that something is horrible. Uh, but you can look at the literature to see with kind of broadly the field in terms of like the level of kind of performance of like uh, other research in the field, like to expect and just de develop some baselines that tell you we can at least get this level of performance. So that's usually how when you start out, like we don't want to pursue projects where there is zero precedent at all in the research world. We know that there is evidence that this approach could work. Sometimes the results of existing methods are not quite where they need to be, but like we make kind of a reasonable guess that this is uh, solvable within a specific time frame, and then invest resources to it. We sometimes don't get it right, and uh, but uh, I think we've kind of refined this intuition and like around how we kind of probabilistically assess whether something will succeed. I would say now that the research team is is larger than it was at that point, we can also have more tolerance for like uh, projects that have uh, less probability of success as well, because we can run more pro projects in parallel. So we always have more high confidence updates to the models and the kind of their, our tools and then kind of more ambitious, high reward, but high risk projects that we pursue at the same time. Uh, but that, that required having a slightly larger team because when we're a couple of researchers, like we really have to have higher confidence that this will work. How large is the research team relative to the product engineering team? Is it like half the size or along those lines? It's uh, about one third at the moment. Uh, so research is one third of product design engineering. And do you try to keep them in sync at all? Like what, what if there's a product feature that relies heavily on a brand new research breakthrough? Like how do you keep them in sync? Or do you just really let them try to run independently of one another? There are some aspects that run independently, like those more long-term research projects. But we generally try to have research collaborate very closely with product and, and engineering. Uh, and that can take the form of research kind of consulting frogs and product engineering of like how to best build interface and tools around the product. Uh, and even though like a research projects may operate at different timelines, there is still very close collaborations in terms of deploying those models and updates between uh, the two teams. So they don't really operate in silos, they operate together. It's just, we always have some uh, some more like pure research projects and some projects that are combined research and like productionized research, essentially. One other aspect of the collaboration that I think has been really critical for us is beyond the product or we also have a creative team within Runway uh, and the creative team has two roles. One is kind of creating content for like communication for uh, our brand and like the way we uh, uh, kind of announce updates to the product and so forth. The other function that is very critical is what we call like a workflow architect function. And it's essentially providing continuous feedback, like using continuously the models and the tools internally and providing feedback to the research team, to the product team around what's working and what's not. So researchers are actually constantly in communication with uh, the creative team and they kind of work closely with each other to develop new models, like get feedback on whether the results are there, whether the controls make sense, all those things. Uh, so research is very plugged in in the rest of the org. It's just that uh, we don't expect that uh, every everything that research is working is going to deliver results like within like a very short time frame. How do you manage these teams kind of at the executive level? Like, is there a head of research, a head of product engineering, a head of creative? How, how does this all kind of organizationally map? Yeah, so kind of roughly there is our engineering org is split between uh, research backend and uh, front end teams. And then we have a creative team that's separate uh, from that. Right now, I, I am the manager of the research team. And then I'm also uh, the uh, there's engineering other functions are, are have dedicated managers to them. Uh, that might change in the future as we scale. But one thing that has been really critical uh, for us as, as a startup is just being able to, like even leadership having some level of individual contribution or technical like hands-on 
aspect in the way we work and just being involved in projects because otherwise it's really when the research is changing so quickly, when the technology is changing so quickly, it's easy to lose track and like kind of lose context on what's, um, what's possible. And so we kind of even the leadership in engineering, uh, is pretty much very involved in like the, uh, maybe not contribute to the, co- the, the critical paths, and, but, but really trying to have hands on involvement in, in different projects. So all of the engineering leaders, it sounds like still kind of are in the code. Yeah. They, they try to be in different extents, uh, but uh, I, I think it's really important in order to build uh, a fast-moving organization and having uh, leaders that have context over what we're working on. Cool. And then last question kind of in this section, um, how do you do goal setting across these different groups? Like, do, do you guys plan goals, you know, on a monthly basis, on an annual basis? And, and how, you know, again, like sort of how much do you try to keep them in sync across the different teams? We have uh, quarterly goals uh, where we essentially set a few themes for a given quarter. And then we define some specific projects that we want to tackle. So Gen 2, for example, is kind of one kind of large uh, effort that we want, like we we tackle at the beginning of the year. Another example of a, a quarterly goal that we set last year was we were going to build in a single quarter 30 magic tools. And kind of we went ahead and kind of built those tools. Uh, so we try to make those goals fairly ambitious and then uh, but not try to get to a really high level of precision around how every single tool and every single feature is going to look like just because we've realized that like things change a lot during the development process and that's especially the case for AI products it's really difficult to have a waterfall process of like developing those things because you can design an interface around an AI model and then have a, a detailed spec around it but then the moment you actually try to build it, you realize the, capability, the limitations of the model, or you realize that the model can do something that you didn't expect. Uh, so we try to be very iterative around how we develop the actual tools and products. Uh, but we try to have a high level, like ambitious goal that we want to kind of accomplish. Is there anything that you you wish you had kind of uh, done sooner or, or changed sooner in terms of the way that you've evolved your team and your engineering organization? What, what's been interesting is that uh, in a lot of ways, like when companies evolve, they get the next stage, they get more uh, revenue and customers. Traditionally, you add more process, you uh, create more detailed specs, you create more kind of robust timelines. And for us, it's actually been the opposite, like in some ways. We had the most detailed product roadmap we've ever had at Runway when we were uh, 10 people uh, and had a very five-year vision of how like, we would build kind of a, a future futuristic video editing product. And it turned out that we learned so much during the first quarter that that vision no longer made sense. Uh, so uh, uh, actually a lot of uh, like our product development process has shifted towards making less assumptions, having very ambitious goals, but actually really leaving the space for learning while developing the thing and really being open to surprise, being open to, you know, maybe in the middle of building this product or this research project, a paper comes out that makes the project already outdated. Uh, And in that case, if you build a lot of hope towards this one project and you build a lot of commitment from different stakeholders that like we really have to make this work, you're not going to make a decision of kind of leaving that project behind in favor of, of, uh, of, of this new method that actually outperforms the approach that you had. So I think sunk cost fallacy is a big, is a big thing that we try to avoid. And like culturally, we've learned to, uh, uh, like embrace change and like be excited by change, uh, and not worry too much about maybe spending a lot of time on something that turned out not to be the right direction. Uh, we try to celebrate that, uh, because otherwise people really get too committed on like an idea that might not be the direction where uh, where things are going. That's really interesting. It's interesting to me that you, at the beginning, you had a very specific five-year vision and you kind of learned over time that you have to be open to surprise. I mean, it's kind of like the opposite direction that I feel like most companies go, as you said. Um, well, how, well, how does that work though when you have um, you know external customers, professional customers? I mean, don't they sort of want to know what's coming? To some extent, uh, they do, but I think primarily what they what they want is for you to solve their problems well. And and actually, uh, when you are not so committed to your roadmap that you don't sit back and just uh, really try to understand the pain points of the customer, you you are actually able very often to develop solutions for them that 
might not have ne- necessarily fit like your your high level plan of where you need to go, but that really uh, s- like solve the the problems that they had. Like es- essentially, because part of our job as we're working with larger enterprises is not just to sell the product and make uh, folks use runway. It's also to translate to them and like kind of showcase what's possible to do with machine learning, with generative models, how they can change their creative workflows and they can move, they can work much faster. They can uh, accomplish more with those methods. Uh, And so a lot of the work that we do is some of it is just showing them the product, but also developing uh, some customized solutions for them, developing like fine tuning models for them, figuring out how do we best serve them. And, and that ultimately is what they're most interested in, less so than understanding like the five-year plan of runway. Uh, because you, as long as you build trust that you're going to solve the problems that they have, um, that's, I think, the most critical thing. I wonder if there's also some advice in here for kind of, uh, you know, founders who are just getting started in AI. Like, if you could give advice, you know, because some of the things that you've mentioned are like, the field changes so quickly. Right, every week or every month, there are new techniques. There's new innovations. What is the advice that you'd give to a founder who is just starting out now um, and building a company in AI to think about how specific their vision should be, how specific their product ideas should be, versus kind of embracing change, continuous change? I think it's a it's a balance of being very specific around who you want to serve and how you see uh, having a, a clear vision of like where you want to arrive in the future versus having a very specific idea of how your products should look, like how you would structure your pricing, how you structure, like all those other details around it. So for us, we never change their focus towards creators, towards creating new kinds of storytelling tools, new kinds of creative tools. That has been a very consistent theme for us. And that has been kind of the driver of a lot of the change that we made because uh, we realized that this, this product direction actually did not accomplish the goal in the way we were hoping. Uh, so as long as that's very clear of like the specific area of focus in terms of the market that you want to uh, solve for or the community or the set of customers that you want to solve for versus being very specific around, I'm going to use this specific ML model or I'm going to use this framework or so forth. Uh, you need to be a bit stubborn about the general, uh, the general vision and the general, uh, of, of what you're building, but at the same time, be very flexible around the specific tools of the specific product that you're building. That makes sense. So how, how do you think about the vision of Runway now? Or do you, have a, do you have a North Star that you think about or kind of a five-year vision these days that you're working towards? Our vision continues to be to invent new kinds of storytelling tools to introduce generative models in creative workflows at the mass, like bigger scale. I think we're still very early in terms of the impact those models can have in the industry. There's a lot of, I've been conversation around those models, but actually in terms of them, being adopted in a uh, in a concrete way, I think we we still have a lot of room to grow and a lot of like uh, a, a, a lot of things to figure out in terms of the tools and the interface around those models. I think we're going to move from focusing a lot on the models and the foundations to focusing on the workflows and the tools and the UIs and, and the specific products that we built around uh, AI models. Um, and that's going to be, I think, a lot of the focus for kind of the foreseeable future for uh, upcoming years, less so than the underlying kind of infrastructure and the kind of foundation models. Anastasis, this has been great. I wanted to uh, kind of wrap up with a few questions that I think will be really interesting to founders and people building in this space and everybody paying attention to this space. When you think of the future of video editing, how much do you think will be done by AI versus humans? So I, I generally, when... Um, Kind of presented with that distinction and generally try to, or we and around we try to challenge it and, uh, and kind of think of like what we're building as a way to augment the capabilities of humans and a way to, to augment the capabilities of creators versus replacing the kind of workflows that, um, replacing kind of the creative process. Uh, and so the way we think about content creation, kind of making art, uh, uh, kind of making movies and so forth is there is a lot of aspects to this process that are particularly tedious where there's a lot, not a lot of creative decision-making and those uh, we could utilize AI models and AI techniques to kind of accelerate them and make them less tedious. But the way we think about uh, our tools is in a way uh, multipliers of human creativity. So 
Uh, it's less about, you know, you're going to type one prompt and you're going to get a full feature length film. It's more, you can now explore ideas for your film at a much faster pace. And so be able to see different possibilities without just kind of spending a lot of resources, without spending a lot of time. That's kind of the approach that we've, we've taken with our tools, uh, kind of augmenting human creativity versus necessarily replacing uh, human creativity. And we still see that today, that the best things that come from uh, Runway and the, and the people that get the most uh, value out of Runway are people with a really clear vision and a very, very specific ideas that they want to express. Runway is not currently going to help you come up with ideas. It's just going to help you build those ideas faster and iterate over more ideas. Looking back at what point in the company building process, did you feel like you had the most momentum? And what do you think made that moment in time unique? There is a, f- a few moments that uh, that come to mind, but one in particular was what I, uh, uh, I mentioned earlier around building uh, 30 magic tools in one quarter. So this is a goal that we set, I believe, early in September of last year. We were kind of working on research for generative models for a while in parallel with building uh, video tools. And those those two kind of efforts had not met in the middle because we were uh, kind of making a lot of progress on the kind of generative image side. Uh, the results were getting better and better, but they weren't yet production level quality. They weren't yet able to be translated into uh, really useful tools. Uh, and But there was this inflection point last year in the summer where we saw that change and we saw that those models could become really useful and like, you could build a lot of like robust functionality around them. Uh, so we set this like very ambitious goal of building 30 tools. And then that really motivated the team to, to really move at a pace where like we had not moved before in terms of iteration speed, in terms of thinking, not just how do, how do we uh, build those tools one by one, but how do we change our infrastructure and, and our development process? in order to support actually building tools faster and like integrating new models faster, uh, building new uh, user interface faster, running the kind of design, like user interviews and like getting feedback from users faster. Uh, so not just move faster, but also move kind of, uh, and work more, but like move kind of smarter and just think about kind of the, the infrastructure that would enable us to actually uh, uh, iterate very quickly on new tools. And then finally, we've talked about advice to founders, future founders, but what is some advice you find yourself giving out kind of over and over again? Something I've realized uh, as we were kind of evolving this company over many different stages, over many different products, over many different uh, iterations. At each point, like we had a big release and we thought kind of, this was it. This was what kind of runway would be uh, forever. We're just going to keep growing this uh, specific kind of product idea or this specific tool. And that never ended up being the case. It always evolved to something else. One general like broad mental model that uh, I've, I've developed is v- very often when um, people describe their product strategy or the, the, the way they do company building, there is one specific uh, idea for how the company will differentiate itself from other companies. And so if you look at the AI space, maybe you think you're at the your model is the mode or the community is the mode or the specific kind of uh, audience that you're building for uh, is, is the mode. And what we've tried very intentionally your runway is to shift strategies like in different stages of the company and just think that the strategy that made sense to grow us to this point is not the strategy that makes sense to grow us to the next point. So we never think like, for example, if we take the kind of our video generation models, we assume there's going to be a point in the future where everyone is going to have a photorealistic video generation model. Like, we don't expect this is going to be the differentiating aspect of runway forever. Uh, but it's, this, it's, it's something that has really enabled us to grow a, a really robust community to really uh, learn a lot in a very quick uh, period of time. But if the conditions change, if the research change, if like the technology change, we can shift to a new strategy and we're not too tight of this company's identity is tied to this specific strategy. Uh, so that, that's kind of one, one area where I think a lot of companies think of themselves as following, having a very clear story around why they're different from others. And I think the real differentiation comes around internal processes and internal culture and how, how you can navigate uh, adversity, how you can learn from what you're building, how you can evolve the company. Anastasis, congrats on all your success so far with Runway and thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. 